Hi, thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be looking at this problem here. It's a very classic problem. I've seen it come up in Putnam's and it's a very sort of stereotypical Oxford or Cambridge uh, interview style question for maths or similar subjects. Okay, so here's the problem. We have a function defined on the xy plane such that whenever we take a square, say ABCD, on the xy plane, it has this property that when we evaluate the function at each of the verti vertices and add that sum up, we always get zero. So for example, here I've got the xy plane and I've taken some random square and uh, labeled the vertices A, B, C, D. Then if I, if I do f of A plus f of B plus f of C plus f of D, I always get zero. Now the question is, must it be that f is identically zero, i.e. f is zero everywhere? Now of course, if f was zero everywhere, then certainly we'd have this property because f of a plus f of f of a f of b f of c and f of d are always zero, and hence this is going to be four lots of zero, which is obviously zero. But the question is, could there be any other function f which has this property? Okay, so if you want to have a go at this, pause the video right now and have a go, uh, and now I'll go over a solution for you. Okay. So my gut instinct when I first saw this problem was surely f must be zero, and in fact that's correct. And I'm going to go and prove that for you. So I'm going to firstly take an arbitrary point on the xy plane and call this point p, say. Now because this question is all to do with squares, it feels as if we should uh, create some squares involving p and perhaps use the fact that the, the, the sum of the vertices evaluated at the function in the function must always add up to zero. Use, use that somehow to perhaps work out what the value of f is at p, and hopefully it should be zero. And from that we can conclude, because p was chosen arbitrarily, that f is zero everywhere. Okay, so what are some natural squares to draw involving p? Or perhaps a square with centre p. Let's go and draw that. Perhaps I'll draw a square first and then redraw p. That's not, not amazing. <laughs> Let me just draw a big square again and then put p in the middle. So P is just any arbitrary point you want. Okay, so P is the centre of this, sort of looking like a square. Okay, that's one square. What other natural squares can we bring from this? Well, that, that could be a vertex, and that could be a vertex of a square. So perhaps if we draw this square on here, and then also we might as well do these others too. So now we've got four squares. So let's label the vertices first. So we've got A, B... C and D. Let's label these vertices of these uh, these smaller squares. So let's call this E, F, G, and H. And I guess one last natural square that comes out of this diagram is this square here. Now, so we've got a total of six squares. This big square here. This. E, F, G, H square, and then these four smaller squares. Perhaps we can use uh, the fact that if we evaluate the function at those vertices and sum them up, we'll always get zero. So first, let's write down what equations we have. So firstly, we'll look at these um, smaller squares. So this, the, this square here, we get F of A plus F of E plus F of H plus F of P equals zero. I'm going to run out of room. That equals zero. There we go. And this one here, same thing, f of e plus f of b plus f of f plus f of p equals zero. Same thing with this square and this square. So f of f plus f of c plus f of g plus f of p equals zero. This square here, f of g plus f of d plus f of h and then plus f of p equals zero. So, so, so before I carry on, some things to notice. Uh, in each of these equations here we have an f of p, and I've deliberately written that at the end to highlight that. And also we're going to have a, b, c and d occurring once, a there, b there, c there and d there, all occurring once. And then e, f, g and h all occurring twice, e, f, g, h and then h, e, f, g. Okay, well we've done the equations for the smaller squares, let's look at the next biggest square, E, F, G, H. Well, F of E plus F of, e, F of E plus F of F plus F of G plus F of H, and that equals zero. Okay, 
okay? I'll just draw a line here. So these four are for the smaller squares, this one's for this sort of slanted square, and then for the big square we have f of a plus f of b plus f of c plus f of d, that equals zero. Right, that's cool. We, we've shown, we always derive sort of six equations from this diagram. Well, remember I said before we've got a, b, c and d each appearing once. Well, we've got f of a, f of b, f of c, f of d. The only other equation that includes them is this one here. But what's quite nice is if we add them up, we get zero. And again, if you look here, we've got e, f, g and h each appearing twice. The only other equation we have involving them is this one here. And again, if we add them up, they all vanish. So it seems as if we should do something with these equations. Perhaps if we add them up, we'll get uh, some nice cancellation. And that's exactly what we do. Because if we add up this left-hand side, we're going to get an f of a plus an f of b plus an f of c plus an f of d. And those all vanish. Those equal zero. And then we're going to get f of e times 2, f of f times 2, f of g times 2, and then f of h times 2. And then, of course, we've got the four lots of f of p's. And then, hopefully, that, that equals zero. And, in fact, it does. But I'll just quickly go over that now and clarify. So f of a plus f of b plus f of c plus f of d equals zero. So we get one lot of zero on the left-hand side. I'm adding up these four equations. Then we get two lots of this equation here. So two lots of zero. And then I've got four lots of f of p. And then on the right-hand side, I've just got zero plus zero plus zero plus zero. That is zero. Well, then zero plus two times zero, that's just zero. So I've got four times f of p equals zero. So if I divide both sides by four, I get f of p equals zero. Okay, so let me just quickly go over what I just did there. I had these four equations here. I added the left-hand sides all up for all, each four of these sides. And then I used these two equations here to get rid of a bunch of stuff. I got rid of one lot of that because that e it equals zero. And I got rid of two lots of this, again, because it equals zero. And all I was left with was 4f of p. And on the right-hand side, I just get zero plus zero plus zero plus zero, which is zero. So I can deduce that f of p equals zero. Now, remember, if we go back to the start, p was just some any point. It was an arbitrarily chosen point on the plane. So because of that, that means f is zero everywhere. Because suppose, for example, it wasn't uh, or take any point on the plane and then just call that point P and apply this exact same argument to deduce that f of P must be zero. So we've shown that the f of P is zero everywhere, hence f is identically zero. So if we think back to the original question, it must be that f is identically zero, which follows our intu intuition, which is nice. If you want a bit of an extended problem, change the problem slightly. So instead of looking at squares, you're looking at triangles. So f is now a function such that when you take any equilateral triangle and you add it at its vertices, you always get zero. And then does it also have this, then the question is, does it have this property? It must f identically be zero. That's a little challenge for you. But yeah, that's all for me for now. Have a great day. See you.